Ladies and gentlemen, my sincere apologies for not being able to speak in your beautiful language. Um, but I'm honoured and delighted by the invitation by the friends to speak here. I would like to thank the friends for this honourable <laughs> invitation. And I would certainly like to compliment uh, Miguel Tsugasa and his staff, and in particular my dear colleague Pilar Silva Maroto with the extraordinary exhibition upstairs. I think one of the best exhibitions, and I'm not exaggerating, uh, which I've seen not only due to the quality of the works, but also the splendid layout. My sincere compliments. The Prado should be and must be proud of this, uh, this exhibition. Ladies and gentlemen, I was asked to speak to compare Jeroen Bos and Peter Brogel. Here he is, Jeroen is Bos upstairs, a portrait which was made in Antwerp, 1572. A row of famous artist painters from the Low Countries, the first kind of art history which was depicted. So this is Jeroen is Bos. And at first sight, you would wonder what does Bos have in common with Peter Brogel? If we look at this, astonishing triptych upstairs here in the Prado. If we look at a beautiful uh, table with devices also from the Prado, and we compare it with the highlights as is known by the broad public with Peter Bruegel the Elder, and here we have Peter Bruegel the Elder also from this series of portraits from 1572 in the same row where Jeroen's boss was depicted, and we think of his famous pictures like here, for instance, uh, the marriage feast from the Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna, and here the famous depiction of the return of the hunters. Very appropriate. I will leave this here for a few minutes. It will give you some cool in the hot summers here in Madrid. Well, at first sight, you would think what do the two painters have in common? And this is what I will try to show you. I will take you on a walk, on a tour, through the life and work of Peter Bruegel, and show you that they do have much in common. And I will try to show you that Peter Bruegel really show, the works of Peter Bruegel really show that he admired Joran Bos as one of the foremost painters of his age, and saw Jeronimus Bos as one of his principal sources of admiration. Just very briefly, what are the similarities? They're both painters with a very small oeuvre. The oeuvre of Peter Bruegel is about 45 works, 45 paintings of which 12 are in Vienna. 65 drawings, and this compares very well with the even smaller oeuvre of Hieronymus Bos. Both were painters who were seen by their contemporaries as the best and foremost painters. They were both extremely famous during their lives, but also after their lives. Jeroen Bos has been copied, imitated, pastichos have been made from, the, from the, his lifetime up to the end of the 16th century. And the same goes for Peter Bruegel, whose works were copied, admired during the entire 17th century. Both have oeuvres which are enigmatic, very difficult to understand the precise meaning of their works. Both are painters which have been interpreted in numerous ways by art historians in the 20th century and the 21st century, often saying more about the art historians themselves than discovering anything useful about the work of Bosch or Bruegel. They have similarities, and I will go into this more in detail during the lecture. They have very strong similarities in painting and drawing technique. The thinness in which Peter Bruegel paints is very comparable, and I checked this again this morning, going through the exhibitions, very comparable to the way which, uh, the, the way which Jürgen Boss paints. So yes, these are all similarities, similarities also in iconography, which you will see later. But there are certainly 
many differences. Just remember Jrunbos, born in 1450. He was born when the Burgundian Empire was establishing itself, was at the height of its power. Jrunbos saw the disintegration of this Burgundian Empire and saw the beginning of the Habsburg Empire in the very early 16th century. While Peter Bruegel, born between 1525-1530, born either in Brabant, um, not very far from, from them, Bos, or possibly in Antwerp, but certainly born in Brabant, born in 1525-1530, at the moment when the Habsburg Empire was at the height of its power and the city of Antwerp was booming to become the New York of Europe, whereas Jürgen Bos lived in a very small, calm city of Den Bosch, never an economic power in the 15th or 16th century. Big differences. And Barreugel lived until 1569 and saw the disintegration of the Low Countries with the religious strifes between the Protestants and the Catholics, with Alpha coming to the Low Countries and uh, the, 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 the attempts uh, of various uh, noblemen um, to gain the power from the Spanish king. But there are much more differences. The workshop, for instance, Jeroen Bos had a large workshop leading to the problems in attribution. You can see this upstairs. What is painted by Bosch, what not. That is a problem which, as a Bruegel scholar, you do not have. It's either Bruegel or it is not. He may have had one or two pupils who helped him to prepare the panels, but no workshop with different hands who assisted him and attribution problems. They had an entirely different career. Jürgen Bos always stayed. He may have made small travels, but stayed, lived and worked in Den Bosch. But Bruegel went out to see the world. He went to Italy, went as south, far, went as, south as, as Naples in the street of Messina, probably Sicily. Um, he traveled a lot in the Low Countries. Differences also in their careers in uh, the subjects, whereas, and you will see this upstairs, whereas Bosch concentrated on religious subjects, yeah, Bruegel concentrated not only on religious subject, not only on mythological and moral subject, but became one of the great masters of the landscape. And of course, copying and painting subjects of the peasants, but we'll see this later. And they had a marked difference, and this will be one of the emphasis later in the lecture, in their worldview. If you look at the work of Euronymous Boss, it is strongly what they call eschatological, looking towards the life after life. Whereas the work of, your own, of, of Peter Bruegel, remember, later in the 16th century, after the rise of the humanists like, uh, like Erasmus and others, he also looked at the world itself, looked at the people. It's intensely religious, the work of Peter Bruegel, but it's relig religious not only looking at the life after life, but also on the way people act on earth itself. The moral conduct of your life is very important. But also what we think we understand, but now we come into the realm of speculation about the characters. If we look at the work of Jeronimus Bosch, it's all very serious. You are marveled at, at the inventiveness of the work of Jeronimus Bosch, but it's serious. It's about life after death. It's even slightly grim. There seems to be here, life on earth seems to be little hope. Whereas if you look at the work of Peter Bruegel, and his contemporaries also said this. Karel van Mander, a famous painter, not a very good painter, but famous because he wrote the first art history of the Netherlands. He wrote some words like, nobody can look at the art of Peter Bruegel without a small smile or without a big smile or grinning. Humor, wit, irony, are very characteristic of the work of Peter Bruegel. So these are all large differences. So why was I asked to, to give a lecture to compare the two? And this is what 
I would like to tell you now. Because, and I'm coming back to the portrait. This is a portrait, as I said, 1572. It was published after the death of Peter Bruegel, died in 1569, but it was probably drawn during the life of Peter Bruegel. So we are looking really at an image of what Bruegel looked like. He died very young, just 40 years old. Uh, he's probably at the end of the 40s. It's probably uh, drawn at the very end of his life. Very interesting is that already during his lifetime, people compare him with your own Miss Boss. So this is not me telling you that we should compare them. No. Where is contemporaries? So for instance, Fasari, Giorgio Fasari, painter who, like Carl von Mander, wrote the first art history, mainly of the Italian art, but also had a few pages on art from the Netherlands. He compared the two. I'll return to this. And it was Carl von Mander who included the words on this portrait. This is portrait from 1572, probably made er earlier. And the Latin verses were reused, reworked by Karel van Mander in the first biography, which we know of Peter Bruegel. So if we look at the words, at the lines, I will not read it in Latin, I will give you, it's probably a little helpful, I will give you an English translation. There's the four first lines on the left. Who then is this Geronimus Bosch once more returned to the world? Who trained with the brush and very deft, very able with the stealers, so he was a very good draftsman, who so imitates for us the dreams of his competent master that meanwhile he surpasses him as well. So what does this line say? And this is by a, a learned scholar, a humanist, Domenicus Lampsonius, who wrote these verses somewhere during the life of, 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 of Bruegel. He asks himself as a rhetorical question, who is this master? Who is this master who is the reincarnation of Geronimus Bosch, so well trained in using the brush and the stylus, the drawing pen, that he only, not only, and it's very imp important, not only imitates us, imitates his competent master, but surpasses him as well. And this is in line, I'm sorry for all the names, this is in line with the words of a famous Italian humanist, Lodovico Guardiardini, was a uh, Florentine nobleman who traveled to the Low Countries and who wrote a thick book about his observations of Ipesi Bassi, the Low Countries. And he also writes about art, and he must have been in Antwerp around 1560, 1561. So he then says that there were two very famous masters, uh, several famous masters, and one was Peter Bruegel. Peter Bruegel, and this was published in 1567, so during the lifetime of Bruegel. Peter Bruegel, acquistato il soprannome Secondo Girolamo Bosco. So it was Peter Bruegel who had, during his lifetime, already received the nickname the second Geronimus Bosch. So during his life, famous authors, artists, the broader public, but, a more, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll only quote these, already saw Peter Bruegel as the new and the second Geronimo Bosco, the second Euron Boss. So let us have a look at his oeuvre. In the beginning of the works we know from Peter Bruegel, there is nothing which alludes to Euronimo's Boss. Karl von Mander tells us that when he was a student of the arts, somewhere in the 40s in Antwerp, that he trained a lot after the works of Euronimo's Boss. But the first works that we know are landscapes. Bruegel traveled to Italy, as I said, traveled as far as Naples and Sicily, and we know this uh, through certain archival sources, but also through drawings like this one, which is in the collection of the Dukes of Devonshire in Chatsworth, and this is what they call the Grande Ripa. This is the, is the Tiber, 
Um, this is the, the harbour of Rome where Bruegel sat. And this is what the first career of Peter Bruegel is, a landscape artist who collected a great number and drew a great number of landscapes during his travels through Italy, came back in 54, came into contact with an old friend, colleague of him called Jeronimus Koch, who had set up an engraving workshop and whose engraving and whose prints were popular throughout entire Europe. Uh, and for Jeronimus Koch, he made 1554, 1555, he made series of magnificent landscapes like these engravings, which reflect his travels in Italy, reflect his travels uh, through the Alps. Magnificent landscapes, and it was with this series uh, with which Peter Bruegel first became famous. 1554, 1555, Bruegel had established himself as one of the foremost painters of the landscapes. And as you will see upstairs, even though the landscapes in the background of Jeronimus Boss are magnificent, we really cannot say that Boss was, by, uh, was a an, 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 an landscape painter um, as with a specialization. But this is where Bruegel set off. But in 1555, he does other things as well. For the same Jeronimus Boss, so he starts off as a draftsman, he starts off as a landscape uh, painter, and he starts as a draftsman for Jeronimus Koch, not only making designs of landscapes, but also of moral compositions. And then, and this is a beautiful drawing uh, from the Kupferstich cabinet in Berlin, the big fish eating the small fish, a beautiful drawing which was reproduced uh, by Hieronymus Koch in this print. The big fish eating the small fish. And this is very typical for the kind of inventions, compositions, which Bruegel makes from 1555 to about 1560. And you will say, ah, is this really after Bruegel? Yes, this is after Bruegel, because if you look in the left-hand corner, you will see that it says, Euronymous Boss invented. It was invented by Euron Boss. And indeed, in the oeuvre of Euron Boss, you will find big fish eating small fish on several occasions. If you go upstairs and look at the magnificent triptych uh, of St. Anthony from um, Lisbon, you will, for instance, but there are more cases where you will find this motif. You will see here a big fish eating small fish. Going back to the engraving. But what is the subject actually? The subject, as you see, is a big fish eating or having eaten. But I will come to this. Having eaten small fish, you will see at the right hand, for instance, other <coughs> smaller or medium-sized fishes eating even smaller fishes. But what has this, what is the implication of this? And this becomes very clear from the rowing boat in combination with the texts underneath. This is very typical for the prints which Jeronimus Koch uh, spread, made and spread throughout Europe. Moral prints with compositions which are elucidated with Latin and on some occasions Dutch and French text very popular uh, with scholars and the upper class throughout Europe. And there you see a small rowing boat, there you see an older man pointing something out to his younger son, or perhaps his grandson, and he says, Ecke, which is Latin for look. He says, look. And underneath it says, uh, in, in Dutch, in Flemish, it says, well, son, this is what I have always known, that bigger fish eat smaller fish. And of course, this is a kind of reality, reality which was as common during Bosch life as it was in Bruegel's life as it is now. The bigger powers, they are stronger than the smaller powers and the bigger powers. You, th you think about the economy, large companies which uh, take over smaller companies or which throw smaller companies out of competition in the economic field. You see this, if you think, for instance, in the situation in Russia, Russia taken over the Krim, big fish 
eat small fish. But, and this is very typical for Bruegel, and about the whole comeback why the name of Bosch is here, is this really true? Because if you look very clearly, and it's very strange that in the Bruegel literature until quite recently nobody really looked at this, is that yes, the big fish are eating the small fish, but what happens is that the big fish is dead, is torn open, and the smaller fish come tumbling out. So the reality, and this is very typical for Bruegel's imagery, and that it's the wit, the irony, and the layers of interpretation, that even when the big fish eat the smaller fish, which is a reality, in the end, it does not matter because even the biggest fish are being torn apart and thus loses what it has tried to eat during its life. So in the end, it's all in vain taking over as a big fish taken over and eating the smaller fishes. So now it's quite certain if you look at the St. Anthony's triptych, and we know that the St. Anthony's triptych was in Antwerp when Bruegel uh, was being trained as an artist in the, in the workshop of P Peter Kuko van Aalst that was with a, a Portuguese merchant around 1540 in Antwerp. But we also know that there were many copies. So we don't know if Peter Bruegel saw the original, but he must have seen uh, many copies, pastichos. He may even have been, as he came from Brabant, he may have been in Den Bosch, so he may have seen the originals. He certainly knew the prints, which uh, were made by Allard du Hemel. Um, so he was aware, very much aware, of what Bosch had created, and he certainly, Piet Bruegel, had the chance to see certain originals by Bosch. So he took over the motive of the big fish eating the small fish, but added a kind of interpretation and added layers and added a landscape which is very typical of Bruegel and does not remind us at all of the work of Joannis Bosch. But then the question might be, but why does it say Joannis Bosch invented, this was invented? One of the reasons traditionally given by art historians is that Euronymous Koch used this as a marketing tool. In 1555, some art historians, or many art historians have said, Bart Bruegel was not as well known as Jürgen Bosch, so we put the name of Jürgen Bosch uh, on, uh, on the engraving, and then it will sell more copies. This is, I think, this is what I also wrote about 15 years ago, but now I've changed my mind. Uh, the only fools who do not change their mind, I think this is a very Bruegelian motive. Because if you look at Fazari, Fazari mentions Bruegel and Bosch and compares the two, and he mentions inventions by Bruegel. And the prints by Bruegel, he adds this. So as far as Florence, because Fazari never went to Antwerp, so as far as Florence, somebody like Fazari immediately recognized a new that this was an invention by Bruegel and not by Bosch. And a second meaning, not often used on prints, but often used in humanist literature of Invenit, is not that this is a literal copy <coughs> after Jürgen Bosch, but that this, that this it is, is an artistic homage. It was inspired. Invenit can also mean that the invention, the original idea, was by Bosch, and it was then finished, altered, completed by Bruegel. This is an artistic process which is very common in 16th century art literature. It's called imitatio and then emulatio, imitating and then emulatio, making it better, using an idea as a source of inspiration and then transforming it, emulating it. And I now think if you look at uh, the source of Fazari, but also other sources. It, it is quite sure that people during his lifetime knew that this was an invention. This was a print after his design by Bruegel. I think the name of Bosch was really added to show, to let Bruegel show that Bosch was his source of inspiration. An homage, the first homage which Bruegel paid to the oeuvre of his famous predecessor. And it's very important to realize that Bosch was extremely popular during the entire 16th century. People tended to speak about a revival of Bosch 
in the 50s and 60s after a period in the 30s and 40s. It wasn't popular, no. Research, recent research of the Bosch imitations uh, show that his popularity uh, was on a continuous peak. It was continuously popular until the very end of the 16th century. And if we go to this, of course, beautiful table with the devices, contested by some, but rightly here, as a authentic work by Bruegel. And then we see Bruegel doing something by not literally copying a motive, but using Bosch, possibly this table, but possibly other works, as a source of inspiration. Between 1557 and 1560, uh, Peter Bruegel designed a series of seven vices, seven virtues, and the last judgment. And you will see several of these uh, works in the next five minutes. This was a hugely important and popular subject in the middle of the 16th century. The middle of the 16th century in the Low Countries, Low Countries was the, 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 the region where the Protestants, whether they were Calvinists or Lutherans, uh, were most present in Europe. There were more uh, Calvinists living in Antwerp in the 60s than living in Basel and, and Geneva. That's, so it's the battles, the religious strifes, but also the differences in opinion, the different theological opinions on religion were extremely important. And one of the key issues in the religious strife between the Protestant dominations and the Roman Catholics was whether you were born with the possibility to improve your fate after life during your life or that's the predestination, or whether you were born with either the destination hell or heaven, and nothing what you will do during your life could change this. This is the, the predestination. So there were a lot of theological debates about the predestination. And in the predestination, and in those opinions, of course, virtues and vices are very important. So traditionally, if you, according to the Roman Catholic Church, if you are born, of course you have the sin with you, but during your life, avoiding the vices, practicing the virtues could help you shorten your period in the limbo and could help you with the final judgment, because it's the final judgment, of course, where when Christ resurrises and the final judgment is being made, that is the moment where your fate for destiny uh, will, will be known to you. It will be either hell or will be heaven. And in the context of all those religious strifes and debates between the Protestants on the one hand and Roman Catholic theologians and moralists on the other hand, images of the virtues and vices coupled with uh, the final judgment were extremely popular. So in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you see in the Low Countries large number of series, virtues, vices, and the last judgment. And this is the context where you must place the, the series by Peter Bruegel. And when Peter Bruegel started, he first started with the sins. Well, probably the sins are more fun to look at, or are you see them around you, we don't know why he started with the sins, but anyway, he started with the sins. And then he made a deliberate choice by making a stark contrast between his depictions of the sins and the virtues, between the vices and the virtues. For the vices, he deliberately chose what I call a Boschian mode. He chose the imagery of Jürgen Bosch, because Jürgen Bosch, and we know this in literature in the 16th century, was known around the middle of the century as the painter of the evil and the sin. Anybody painting a hell or a temptation of St. Anthony, 
vices, anybody in the middle of the 16th century would refer to Jeroen Bosch as the main source of inspiration. So that was the image which people had, that the contemporaries of Peter Bruegel, of Jeroen Bosch, of, of, the contemporaries of Bruegel would think of Jeroen Bosch, and rightly so, if you go upstairs, you will see this, as the painter par excellence of the Im imaging and, 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 and depicting the bad, the evil, and hell. And this is what Bruegel also showed. And here you see one, you see the Everest, uh, is one of the series. You see it's it also published by Euronymous Koch. Uh, you see the same kind of build up uh, as, as the other prints, uh, horizontal format, a complex composition, which in all details will remind you of the imagery of Jeroen Bos. Then you will have a personification in the, the center, a personification uh, with all kind of attributes which refer to the sin which is being depicted, like, for instance, the toad, this is Ephorus, which is considered to be one of the, the, the most foul sins after superbia, and then again, you would have a Latin line and a, a line of Dutch text, which would not give a literal explanation, but would help you decipher. So what is the public for these kind of prints? That was not the common person. These were humanists, humanists these were collectors, this was the wealthy, educated part of society throughout Europe. We know Euronymous Koch, uh, also was present in the Frankfurter Buchmesse. You will associate, if you are in know anything about books and publishing, you will think of the Frankfurter Buchmesse as something which is of the 20th and 21st century. It's the biggest fair of publishers and books in the world. But the Frankfurter Buchmesse was already there in the 16th century, and we know that Jeronimus uh, Koch was present. He also had catalogues, catalogues where prints such as these were listed. That so people would go there, could buy there, but there was also ordered. We know slightly later that, for instance, Benito Arias Montano was the librarian in Escorial. He was a good friend of, of many. He had lived in Antwerp uh, for a long period. Uh, we know that Montano uh, ordered prints from engravers such as Jerome Scock, such as Philip Galle. So prints like these were made for, for a very educated part of the public, an international part of the public, um, and prints such as these were spread throughout Europe. So here you see this kind of composition where, uh, and I don't need to go into details here, where the Boschian influence is very clear, but it's also very clear that when Bruegel takes over an image by, by Bosch, it's never a literal, he never copies. He uses a kind of, of uh, he uses imagery by Boss as a source of inspiration and then transforms it. I will give you an example. So, for instance, here, from the Garden of Love, um, one cannot compare this very well with, for instance, this preparatory drawing by Peter Bruegel. This is for the sin of lust. Uh, so you will see all kinds of images. Uh, all kind of imagery which relates to lust in, in general. And if you look at the female personification in the trunk, then it strongly reminds you of, for instance, this detail um, uh, from the Garden of Lust, taken from a completely different context, but using it, reusing it. And then if you dwell into the details uh, of this, uh, this beautiful uh, drawing, um, then you will see all kinds of details which relate to Bosch, but not literally. Um, so for instance, the, all the, the animals, which are half animal, half human uh, creations, which are half animal, but also combined with objects. You will see them all there, all kinds of monsters, bizarrities, and if you look at prints such as these, if you look at compositions such as these, you immediately understand, without even knowing all the details, you immediately understand why contemporaries in this period already called Bruegel the second Jürgen Boss, who even surpassed the work of the master. 
So for instance, uh, this is then a, an image a detail, which again comes from the Antonius triptych. Um, and you will never see a literal copy of this print, but then look again at all the animals, all the fantasy cre cre uh, creations which Beugel has here, then you will see that they have a, really have a lot in common. So this continues, of course, uh, here, just after finishing the series of uh, devices, 1556, 57, uh, then he, made the, the, the last judgment, the last judgment which again is very Boschian in atmosphere, very logical because Bosch, as no other painter, uh, was a master in depicting the hell and, and also the last judgment which you will see upside. And again, you will see the big fish eating or the big fish eating something, you will see it there. But you also see to the right, I forgot to put an image on it, but if you go upstairs and you look at the beautiful drawing of the owl's nest, um, there you will see an image with owls uh, on the right by Bruegel, which um, although we do not know if Bruegel ever saw the drawing of the owl's nest, um, but we are quite certain that there must have been related copies or, 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 or other paintings or drawings by Bosch which you must have seen as they are so close. And this is of course where you will see uh, the moment, the final judgment, uh, where you will see uh, where Christ judges all the souls after the resurrection and all the people resurrecting from the grave and you will see all those that are damned uh, going uh, into the hell, and you will see all those uh, whose fate will be the heaven going up to heaven. So this is the balance moment, and y y if you want to understand somebody like Peter Bruegel, but also Bosch, and the, this they have in common, um, whether you're religious or not, it's not where you are religious, but you must understand that the work of these masters, both these masters, is intensely religious, different in mode, as so I said, different in tone, hope by, with the works of Bruegel, much less hope, certainly for your fate on earth with your own boss, but intensely religious. In the 16th century, we know this from all what humanists write, we know all this also from ego documents, everything you do during life stands in relation to the fate of life. Your life on earth does not make any sense if you do not relate it to what will happen to you after life. Of course, it is not that everybody at every moment thinks about this, but you have to understand that this is quintessential in understanding pictures from the low countries in the 16th century. So this is actually one of the most important moments for any person uh, in the 16th century or in his perception of his life, of course. But then you see and it's 1558, 59, Bruegel works on the virtues, the four cardinal virtues and the three theological virtues. Here you see temperance, temperantia, and a completely different atmosphere. And there you see also the big differences between Bruegel and Bosch. Bruegel, and this was very conscious because in the work of Peter Bruegel, but this is something which I could give another lecture on. Bruegel was very much influenced by the theater of his time, what we call Rederijkerstoneel rhetoricians. This was moral kind of literature which uh, was shown in, 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 in theaters, on spectacles, uh, outside moral plays which were extremely popular in the 50s and the 60s, and uh, if you look at these plays, uh, you will often find subjects uh, which directly relate to the oeuvre of Peter Bruegel, who must have seen a lot of these plays and was inspired by them. And it was probably, uh, and you can see this, this is why I show this to you, if you look at, this is the print after the drawing, the drawing also exists, is in the uh, Museum Bornholz van Beuning in Rotterdam. So if you look at the upper left, there you will see one of those plays being performed 
So there you see spectators standing, looking at a play which is being performed. This was reality. It's for us very difficult to imagine. I always tell this to my students. We are, since the middle of the 19th century, we're being bombarded by visual impressions, since the invention of photography. And then, of course, with television, and then with the multimedia, internet, etc. For us, it's normal to be bombarded by visual impressions. We see hundreds of them, thousands of them each day. If you go back to the period before 1815, if you go back to the 16th century, where would you get visual impressions? Paintings were in churches, many paintings were in collections where were not readily accessible to the common public. So what was there? Indeed, the churches were there, where you would not see paintings like we see them being displayed. And then you would have processions, religious processions, but also more worldly processions, and you would have theaters and plays. So you must imagine that the occasions where people saw plays being performed, when they saw an, a, a religious procession with images, with paintings actually being uh, pulled through at cities, made a terrific impression on people. Those were the few moments, or one of the few moments, where you could have visual impressions from other dimensions. So plays were very important, were very powerful, were being watched by hundreds, if not thousands, of people. And Peter Reuchel was tremendously impressed by such plays, uh, by such processions. He may even have been a part, but that we don't know, as many of artists were involved in creating processions, were involved in uh, stage designs of those plays, but we simply have no sources to prove that Reuchel was one of those artists. But then he made the choice not only to use a setup, which is very theoretical, uh, which relates to the theatre, but also, and that's the big difference with the Vices, in a contemporary stage. So with the Vices, you have Bosch, the Boschian image, which everybody would have realised and would have associated with Bosch as the painter of evil and hell. And the Vices, he took a more contemporary. And this is probably because in this way, because the virtues were actually more important, of course, it was important to avoid the vices, but it was even more important to follow the virtues. And by placing virtues in a contemporary setting, the idea actually would be that the virtues were around you, was something of everyday life, something which you could practice as being. So if you look at other images, I will show you here the preparatory drawing of hope. I will explain somewhat more on this. But there you will see a setting uh, which could be Antwerp or Brussels or Ghent in the second half of the 16th century. It's a contemporary setting which it, it, every viewer could, real, could see as, as being contemporary. And thus, that was the idea behind this, give a stimulus to follow the good example of the virtue. But the virtues were also always as I said, in, seen to be in, in the light of the hope afterlife. Because if you look at this as hope, and this is a very Bregalian kind of image, um, and this is a big difference with Bosch. If you look at hope, actually, if you look at it very closely, at first, there seems to be very little hope. So you will see the personification, very traditional, of hope with an anchor and other uh, attributions. But here, everything is hope of a slight, very slight improvement because what is the hope that people have sitting there in their dungeon? They hope to have a little water. You see upstairs there, going up, you see a flask which is being hung out there why is being hung out there? Because they hope, apparently, they get little water. So they hope to catch a little rain. That is their hope, a slight improvement. Whereas, very Bregalian, the hope in the background, if you look at the upper left, you will see a farmer trying to protect his land against the rising water. 
won't help because you will see that what he's trying to build is not high enough, will certainly not succeed in protecting his land from flooding. So whereas the people there in the right have no water and are despairing, hoping for a little water, the farmer on the left is hoping he won't have too much water. Hope, if you look, very common, of course, in the 16th century, very 15th and 16th century, fire, fire in cities, with very tight re regulations to avoid fire, because if there was a fire, often it would spread to hundreds of houses, very dangerous. So avoiding fire was very important. So there you see a very typical uh, uh, townscape, cityscape from the southern Netherlands in the 16th century. There you also see people needing a lot of water, trying uh, to, uh, uh, what's again is English, uh, to, to, to put out the fire in the houses. Whereas when you go to the left, there is too little water there. If you go to the left, of course, the ships, the shipwrecks, the men try, uh, in the fear of drowning, they have too much water. And then again, uh, this, and that's the Boskian element, then you see this large monster, even in, an, in, in, in a print like this, which at first sight you think there's nothing which relates to boss. If you look at the lower left, then certainly you see a monster kind of a fish, fish which, and the man, you can see him in the very lower left corner, being scared, his hair is being standing right out. So scared is he of being swallowed by this monster fish. But this fish actually is a reference and you will see fishes like these in, in various uh, pictures of Jon Bos to Leviathan, one of the uh, Old Testament monsters from hell. So all the hope which there is is a slight hope, a slight hope on the one hand of a proven of your fate during life, but in essence, and uh, hope is the hope of improving by, by your fate after life. So if you practice the virtue of hope, you do this not for hoping that your fate on earth will immediately improve. You might, you might get a little water extra, you might succeed in protecting your land, you might succeed in putting out the fire in time so that your house is not destroyed, but the real hope is the hope of a good fate or a not too bad fate in the life after life. But a deliberate choice not to use the Boskian mode, but here to use a realistic 60th, 16th century setting. And then it seems, seems, that we're now at 1558, that Bruegel really takes a different path, takes a path which leads him away. He started as a landscape painter, but then became involved with the Boschian imagery. And then it seems that he leaves Bosch behind for good. And then we see beautiful works of art this is also a preparatory drawing, one of the very few drawings which is still in a private collection. Um, beautiful drawings of skaters before the St. George uh, Gate in Antwerp. Um, but even this drawing, and that's always the case, and in this sense, Bruegel and Bosch are the same, because if you think you can understand Bosch, you only stand the first dimension, the first interpretation of a layer. Then you go underneath always one or two layers, and you're never sure how they relate to each other. Very difficult to interpret the work of Jürgen Boss, and this is also the case with Rögel. This is one of the more clear ones. Uh, so this, at first sight, is a uh, fun ice skating. Very, something which was very important this time. This was the period in the beginning of a new ice age. Yes, if we think we're going to either a cooler or a hotter climate, yes, there was a, a small ice age and there were problems with the climate starting around 1555, continuing to about 1650, what we call the small ice age with a drop of average temperature of about three to four degrees with a lot of problems, famines, etc., etc. So this was the period when ice, and because in this period before, there were wines growing in the southern Netherlands. And this was the beginning of the new ice age and this is also the start of a series of winter landscapes with people skating. So this was something which became very popular and Bruegel stands at the beginning of the, uh, the, the winter landscape traditions in the Netherlands, the, low, the southern Netherlands and the northern Netherlands. 
So this is something which Bruegel must have seen. But there are various layers. Um, I only have a detail of this print. The one detail which I am which is lacking is at the, the far left. And there you would see a woman pointing something out. And then she's pointing towards what you see the upper right corner. You see somebody, because this is ice. You're skating and you think you're, you're really standing firm. But with ice as it goes, or skating as it goes, one small mistake and you're down and out and you're lying on the ice. And we know of 16th, 17th century copies of this print, which have Dutch text underneath, and they warn you of the slipperiness of life. So this is an allegory on life, because when you're there, when you live, you might be wealthy, you have a happy family, you're healthy, you have children which are doing well. It can change at any moment. The slipperiness of life, just like when you're standing on the ice, you're skating, you're having a lot of fun, you make one mistake, and it's gone. So it's the slipperiness of life, which is the second layer. And then there might even be, we don't know, but it's hypothetical, a third layer. Because if you look at the gate, St. George Gate, why the St. George Gate? Well, it could have been because Bruegel lived nearby, could have been because he just liked it. It was a, a new gate. It was there just, was built about three, four years, or finished three, four years before Bruegel drew this drawing. So he might have thought this is a very impressive gate. The important, largest, newest gate of the booming city of Antwerp. Let's take this as a point of departure. Yes. But what everybody in Antwerp knew, and Bruegel certainly did, is that this gate and the building of the fortress around it was at the very heart of a corruption scandal. Yes, again, we think corruption scandals with building are something of the 20th and 21st century. No, I can assure you, corrupt politicians, yes. Bribes, yes. Uh, so, it was all there scandals at the exact moment. When this was made, there were several high officials and building contractors and people in the court being tried, even from former burgomaster was understanding on trial. And to add, he was not a suspect, but he was one of the people who gave a testimony, was the brother of the publisher, Jeronimus Koch. So the brother of the publisher, Jeronimus Koch, was in court giving testimony. He was not on trial, he was not a suspect. He had testimony about the bribes. So, and then you think about the slipperiness of life. Yes, you are a burgomaster. You're powerful, you're there. You think nobody can do anything. Yes, you take bribes, and there you fall. The ice, you made a mistake, you're down and out. So this is a kind of triple layering which is very typical. So this is the direction which Bruegel goes. And you will think, well, here, indeed, like with this print, this engraving, Bosch is out of sight, you think. Yes, in this image, indeed, very typical of Bruegel. It's called Every Man. This is an image of somebody who's searching his way He's called Elk, it stands for everybody, could be you, could be me. And he's searching his way, he uses a candle. Why does he use a candle anyway? It's daylight, as you can see. He has spectacles, I think they will not help him. And he goes everywhere, because you will see the image of Elk on several places. You will even see him in the, there in the uh, Tom, which is uh, on the lower left corner. And then you get the layers again, because the public which would have seen this print would have immediately thought of Diogenes. Diogenes, who was a philosopher, and we know that Diogenes, with a lantern during daylight, went to Athens to look for a true and honest man, like Elk would look 
but he looks for worldly possessions. And Diogenes lived in a tun. You may have heard the story that the emperor came to see Diogenes and said if Diogenes had any wishes, and that Diogenes said to the emperor, only one wish that you step aside so that I won't be sitting in your shadow. <laughs> anyway, that's Diogenes. So people would have recognized this as a, that's a layer. But the real clue to the interpretation is at the back. There you will see a fool, you will immediately recognize him as a jester. And there's a Dutch text underneath. Niemand kent himself, uh, nobody knows himself. So what is this about somebody searching about who is he, what is truth? Men searching for himself. And of course, he should be finding it upstairs, going to the church. Um, but instead, he looks everywhere else. And of course, nobody knows himself. He won't <laughs> find himself. So this is the direction which Brogel goes. And then he starts paintings. And we'll not explain them because they lead us too far from Bosch. Those are the children games uh, from Berlin. Delightful, beautiful, uh, 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 delightful painting. I have to keep the time at hand. Delightful painting, and he continues with the proverbs, all kinds of paintings which you do not associate with Bosch. But then, even in these years, 1560, there are moments when he turns back to Bosch as a source of inspiration. Yes, the Stone of Madness, you will see it upstairs by Bosch, also from the Prado. A, a subject which was popular, and not only in, is, does Bosch painted it, but it was very popular with the imitators of Bosch. So this certainly will have been a source, perhaps not the, 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 the Prado painting, but the copies and other versions of the Bosch would have been a source of inspiration to have the same subject made into an engraving um, with other complicated. Here again, you can see that Bruegel added all kinds of meaning, starts with Bosch, but then goes further. And then you see that Bruegel, who starts as taking iconographic elements from Bosch, transforming them into something which is immediately recognizable as a Bosch, goes a step further. He uses the atmosphere of Bosch. Here, you will find no literal copies of the Bosch or imagery directly relating to Bosch, yet everybody who sees this, this is Mad Mac, this is in one of the key pa paintings by Breugels in a smaller Antwerp museum, uh, Meyer uh, van den Berg. This is a woman, hell have no fury like a woman in wrath. Uh, this, here you will see Mad Mac, uh, who is leading a troop of women uh, through hell. And even the devils are afraid of Mad Mac. Um, very interesting, very complicated. And here again, you will see the fish eating somebody, but all as minor details in a bigger composition, which relates to Bosch in a more general way. Of course, if you look at the background, also in the painterly technique, um, for instance, in the way which uh, how Bruegel depicts in some of his painting uh, uh, the, the, the towering infernos in the background is very similar in his treatment of the brush and the coloring uh, to paintings by, uh, by Bosch. And this comes from a part of the St. Anthony triptych in Lisbon. Then, of course, we have the, the painting here, The Triumph of Death. The Triumph of Death is exceptional in Bruegel's oeuvre. Exceptional because here you do not find any hope. Whereas in all paintings of Bruegel, there is hope somewhere. This, go upstairs, it's now much quieter than in, with the, than in the Bosch, of course, but go, if you have seen Bosch, go back, look at The Triumph of Death and see how it relates to Boss and how this also relates to Bosch in the sense that there is no hope for men. Whether you're rich, whether you're a pope, whether you are poor, whether you're beautiful, young, old, death takes you and it takes you in the most gruesome of ways. And you will f find it not only in general atmosphere but also in certain details. This comes from the Haywain, but the, the way this is painted and the motive of uh, you can find quite similar aspects in the triumph of death. But then there is hope again because the, the triumph of death belongs to a series of three. So the Mad Mag, the triumph of death also uh, were probably made 
together with this strikingly beautiful painting. This is uh, Michael uh, slaying the, uh, the, the rebellious angels. It's in the museum in Brussels. Uh, very colorful, very bright. Of course, this is about hope. This is where the evil is being defeated by the archangel uh, Michael. All kinds of elements which relate to boss, you can see them everywhere, um, but also in the coloring and, and the use of bright colors. Here, for instance, you will see a part of the last detail of the last judgment in Vienna, unfortunately not on the exhibition here, but also in, in this bright, very bright and usually bright colors. And uh, this comes from the last judgment, uh, the part of a large judgment uh, from Munich. And then we continue, then Bruegel starts concentrating on landscapes and other aspects which do not relate to Bosch, but even in 1563, he, for instance, makes uh, this engraving, Christ descending into the limbo. Uh, he also makes uh, a temptation of St. Anthony, 1562. Uh, but here again, you will see how he uses Boschian motors, but transformed. If you look at the head, of the monster. You see Anthony here in the right con corner. See, of course, one immediately has to think of this uh, aspect from uh, the Garden of Love, but it's so entirely different. So he takes up the idea and transforms it into something completely different. Sometimes he seems to have used uh, elements. If you look at this beautiful painting from Bruegel, this is from London. Um, Nothing Boschian at all. This is truly influenced by Italian Mannerist painting, uh, both in its coloring and in its composition. Um, but then if you, again, if you look at the Dark King, and for instance, which I only recently noticed, I had the, the opportunity to see this, and I think this is really one of the marvels of the exhibition. I was very lucky to see uh, this in the conservation studio here on several occasions and see it being transformed from a beautiful painting to an exceptionally beautiful painting. But then if you look at the Dark King standing on the left here of the Adoration, I only very recently realized that this is very similar in its treatment and its coloring and its position to uh, to the Bruegel painting, something, um, this is the first time that I showed them together, so this is something which I really recently noticed and something which I have to work out, as I think the relation between Boss and Bruegel still has a lot of problems which have not been solved, that's something for the future. And then we come, and this is the final part of my talk, uh, very briefly as I discuss this uh, on several occasions to the painting, uh, which Pilar and I introduced into the Bruegel literature uh, about four or five years ago, uh, coming from a private collection in Spain. Um, it's the pouring of wine of St. Martin's. I will not go into its iconography. It's very interesting, very complicated. It's a very ambitious painting, very large, very ambitious. It's, uh, here you can see it after its conservation. Uh, it's, it's a tooth line. This is why it's been uh, damaged a lot in the course of the centuries. Uh, now, at first sight, again, this is around 1565. You would not think this has anything to do with Bosch at all. Yes, it does relate thematically to, for instance, then we go to again to the Avaritia and the Gula, to themes which Bruegel did. Um, but in its imagery, there is nothing Boschian. But then, this was painted in 1565. Uh, the, the 15, you can see a, a part of the signature and dating, and you cannot see it here, but we could see it, and you can see it if you go to the gallery. You can see a part of a signature and dating. Uh, it's either 1564, 5, or 6, I think, probably 1565, because in 1565, in Brussels, this tapestry was being woven. This is also St. Martin. In the composition, it has nothing to do with Bruegel, of, of Bosch. Bruegel, uh, this is Bosch after Bosch, it's nothing to do with Bruegel. But the fact that in 1565, when Bruegel lived in Brussels, and if you realize that tapestries were the most luxurious, the most important, the most costly 
of artworks being produced in the 16th century. And if you know that Bruegel had very good connections with the, the upper part of society in Brussels, then it's, it's sure that somebody like Bruegel, who had such an interest in Bosch, would have at least on a few occasions have seen this tapestry being woven. Even if he did not, let's just suppose, I don't think so, but even if he would not have seen the tapestry, then he would have known the engraving which was made after the preparatory design for the tapestry. So here you see, so in its depiction of St. Martin, this is completely different. But yet here, Bosch, the famous artist, artist with the image, with the subject of St. Martin being woven in 1565 in Brussels with a print made by Euronymous Koch, with whom Bruegel had very strong connections. I cannot think anything else that this must have been a stimulus. There must have been the incentive for Bruegel to think, yes, there we have this tapestry, extremely prestigious, a tapestry of the, the painter which so influenced me. This is a starting point for me trying to make my one of my most ambitious compositions on the same subject, but I will do it my way, and to say it in a Sinatrian way. And he did it his way, completely different, <laughs> but just as ambitious, very large in scale, about 100 people being here, it's one of his most intricate. If you look through the damages, it's one of his most intricate, one of his most ambitious, one of his most difficult paintings. Must This, in its original state, must have been uh, an incredible sight. And I am sure that this was directly inspired. Then, after these years, he makes paintings which do not relate to Bosch at all, such as these landscapes, all highlights from Western art, but like these. But then, even in this painting, a beautiful painting, the nest robber, small painting, if you look, for instance, in the background, in the thinness of which the landscape and the use of the imprimatura, which is the ground layer, which uh, is so subtly used, and if you now look at the, the triptychs and you look at the background, it's the same manner of painting. And then in the same year, this is 1568, the last year of which we have paintings. Probably, you know, this painting is the blind, leaning the blind. It's also a line. It's in the Capo di Monte in Naples. But then I cannot help thinking that, for instance, if you look at the peddler and you look at the way it's painted, look at the figure, but also in the way the houses are treated, that there is certainly an influence, and that this certainly is inspired by Euronymous Boss. So, as a conclusion, if we look at Bruegel, we see an artist who starts and was seen and is acclaimed as a new Euronymous Boss. We see that from his very beginnings, after he first concentrates on the landscape, he uses the Boschian imagery, quoting but always transforming, always the imitatio emulatio. But after his first years, when it was a more literary ap ap approach, he then uses Bosch as a source of in imagination. He really uses Bosch as a starting point to create uh, a new world, creating, recreating. That is something which only the greatest of artists can do, something which Bosch did in his own time and which Bruegel, using more than often has been realized, Boss, as a source of inspiration, does 60 years later. Ladies and gentlemen, you have an extraordinary ex exhibition up there of an extraordinary artist, but, but, there is more to come. 2019 is the commemoration of 450 years of the death of Peter Beuchel. In Vienna, I will be curating hopefully a just as beautiful exhibition, monographic exhibition of Bruegel. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, that if you go back to Bosch, take this in your mind, take, put it into your mantle map, please come back, go to Vienna in 2019, look at Bruegel and make the connections between the two, creating, recreating two towering giants from art history within three years between the Prado and the Kunsthistorisch 
ladies and gentlemen, I think you are very lucky if you can see both of them. I wish you a very rewarding conference and I wish you a lot of joy looking at the beautiful works of art and Bosch and Bruegel upstairs. Thank you very much.